We are here because we know the outcomes in our lives are within our control. That taking absolute ownership of how we eat, sleep, train, think, and connect with each other is how we'll optimize our health and happiness. That chasing excellence is how we grab hold of what is possible. Our mission is to live on the run, always chasing, never stop. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Chasing Excellence. How are you, Ben? Doing great. Thanks, Patrick. How are you doing? I'm doing wonderful. It's Good. a beautiful day here it, as we yes. record this. Yes. Beautiful. What it, October. It doesn't feel like October, so it's lovely. We are jumping back into our Hopper Talk. Hopper Talk is when uh, we take random, <laughs> quite, quite random questions from the internet, and then we uh, see what each other think and see if we agree or see if we disagree, uh, and basically just have some fun and use it as an excuse to have some fun. Not that we don't cool. always have fun. But so today we've got seven questions that we are going to dive into. First one, I'm going to let you go first. What is a seemingly mundane question that you can ask somebody that will tell you a lot about their personality? Okay. So, um, because it has to be mundane. Yeah. So obviously if it wasn't mundane, yeah. Yeah. yeah, So uh, to me, it has to be like, that means like, uh, just something like every day, like not out of the Mm -hmm. ordinary. But if it, was, if it was bigger, it would be something very different. You know, it might be yeah. something along. Uh, uh, but let's keep it the mundane. I actually think, um, how are you doing? Can tell you a lot about someone's personality. So because what most people, are they just going to, because we just asked each other that. Like, how are you doing? I, 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 I answer it the way I usually answer it, which is I'm, I'm doing great. I'm doing fantastic. I, like, mm-hmm. I really do love life, you know. And, um, but when you ask other people, it's like, I'm doing okay, you know, mm-hmm. getting by, um, you know, good. Just like the standard. Or are they do they go off on this tirade of this big, long soliloquy about how they're actually doing? It can – to me, that can be a window into a, what people are – thinking um a lot about but I'll, I'll I'll give another one that Heather and I talk a lot about which is when you ask somebody if they would like something that you're going to do like would you like me to get you a glass of water how they respond to that I think tells a lot about their personality and we actually have a rule in our house that in our family that um we don't allow people to answer what most people answer with that, which is sure. Mm. Sure, I feel is so negative in that sense. It's like, yes, if you would like to get me a glass of water, I will allow you to get me a glass of water. Yep. So he- the reason this comes up is because Heather was at the bus stop yesterday morning and she just ordered a whole bunch of new masks for the kids. They have to wear the masks to school still. And – there was an extra one, which was way too small for our kids. It was for a young child. And at our bus stop is one of our very, very good friends. And they had a, uh, they have a toddler, a very young kid. And Heather said, um, Rob, would you like um, this mask? It's brand new. It's still in the package. Would you like this mask? He said, sure. And she, <laughs> she called him out on it. She's like, Rob, we don't say sure. So she had this whole kind of like, she went through the soliloquy of like the reasons why we don't say sure. It's like, you, yeah. if you, if you would like it, then say, thank you. Like, yes, that would be fantastic. Thank you for offering. Like don't bypass when people are trying to do nice things for you. Similar to that is when people ask, would you like, you want to go to the movies on Friday? Sure. It's like now that this, that window, now that you, you can't unsee it yeah. when people say sure. And I hope, I hope I didn't wreck people's, you know, conversations with people when they say it. But to me, that does highlight a lot of the way people think about the world is if they say, sure, it's like, yeah, people just kind of, as opposed to like, yes. And are they grateful? Do they appreciate the small things? Is there intention behind their words? Is, does, um, are they aware of what's happening, what other people are doing in that to me highlights a lot. I'm pause one second. Just thought I, I just thought I heard cats fighting, so I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> uh, they, it might be. I just, I just can't see anything. Um, All right. So what's yours? One mundane so, question. 
I did. I skipped. I honestly skipped right over the mundane element of it, Ooh, and I just see? Kind of, like you can't. Not, I didn't skip over, but I was like, yeah, that's not as important as coming up with a question. And so now you've got me totally rethinking it. And I don't. I don't have a good mundane question. So I'll give you the one that I All did right, have. Hear. What's the big one? With the admission being like it's not mundane, at least in the in the way that that you laid it out, which I kind of agree with. Which is, um, where did you where did you spend or uh, or what did you spend the last kind of two hundred and fifty dollars of completely unnecessary, completely you know discretionary spending on? Where did you spend the last two hundred and fifty dollars on something that wasn't you know food, shelter, gas for the car, et cetera? And I think that that I think that that I think that that's an interesting window into what is important to that person. Mm. That's like a Tim Ferriss question, right? Well, that's a good question. He says, like, what is it, like under 50 bucks? Yeah, like, like hundred. yeah, has, spending a yeah. hundred under a hundred dollars yeah. that blah, blah, blah. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. I didn't think of that. Um, no, but I like it. But I, yeah. yeah, one thing I've been thinking about a lot, and I think it's why I came up with this question, because I was already half thinking about the, this anyways, which is I've been thinking about, I don't really have a great name for it yet, but the the four things that we spend the four kind of finite resources that we have to Mm -hmm. spend our energy, our attention, our time and our money. And my contention this is kind of like, I've been just batting this around in the back of my head for the last week or so is that the quality of our lives, or at least the degree of satisfaction in our lives comes down to how intentionally, how well you spend those four things, how well you spend the energy that we have, how well you spend the attention, the time and the money. And so I think that's probably why I got, I was thinking about this question because it tells me a lot about at least where you're spending one of those four, whatever, uh, uh, you know, finite resources that you have. And your actions tell me a lot about who you are and what you believe or what you do anyways, certainly. Yeah, we can keep that kind of mundane. That's that's fairly mu- like we're, we're just not. Less, it's not yeah. exciting. It's not the exciting. Last thing you bought that? Yeah, last thing you bought. What, what's the last thing you bought? So, yep. All right. So I'll go. The bigger question that I would go with if it was bigger would be, what would you change um, over the last year of your life? Mm, that's a good because that's going to tell me like I don't want to know about your childhood like that's like too far removed and all that stuff and I that's not necessarily yeah I probably did form your personality more than what happened last year. <laughs> Yeah. Or what you choose or what you highlight out of that question, I think is going to tell me so much. People go like, nothing, man. My life is amazing. I wouldn't change anything. Like I am where I am because – like, okay, that tells you so much. Yeah. If people go, um, I wouldn't have elected Biden president. Like I can't believe that. That was the one thing I would – like, oh my gosh. Like what did that person value? If people go, you know, um, uh, I, I would have changed that uh, coworker that sat next to me and she was such a dot, 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 you know, like – I think it would bring so much – it would highlight so much of what they're giving – what you just said, which I love, is where they're giving their attention to because that to me is the most of those – that's the most finite of those resources. Time, we don't know. Time is relative. Mm-hmm. Money is actually not finite. You can get more, you get more but money. your attention is the one that like you're never getting it back and it certainly is finite. Yeah. Yeah. It's th- yeah. Money is definitely not finite, but it's limited and yep. I think that that's probably yeah. what it is. Cool. Yeah. I like that. All right. Next question. We'll move on. Uh, what have you managed to avoid your entire life? Okay. You're up first on this one. Me first. Okay. So <laughs> two things that pop to mind. The first is that I've managed to avoid never getting into a fist fight, which pro- might not be a surprise or might not be a surprise to anybody. Who knows Wait, you've me, avoided but... never getting into a fist fight. That means yeah, that you're always I've avoided fist, fist, fist fights. Fight. Okay. Yes. You're right. You're right. I've avoided name. ever... <laughs> Being in a fist fight? I've avoided, I've avoided being fist in a fist fight. Yeah. <laughs> so that's one thing. I've been punched before, but I, did, I, but I walked away. But you didn't punch me. Um, and then the other one, which might be the, the, the slightly more interesting one, is, and only because of the context of having gone to film school, undergrad and graduate school, I've never watched a second of any Star Wars movie, any Star oh Wars TV gosh. show, any Star Wars cartoon. I don't, I, it's not on purpose. It's just like, I've just never what? done it. And I think that that's, it's one of those weird things that like, I probably never mentioned when I was in film school. I just, it was like, a, it was a deep, dark secret that I kept. Wow. Maybe this is the question that we should, this is the question from the first one that highlights. This you is the mundane one. Yes. All right. What have I avoided? Um, I've avoided debating politics. Uh. So I, I don't, 
I, I'm I just because I, I I feel it's like, it's like debating religion. It's just such a futile. It's like you're not going to change other people's perspective. You're just it, you're just feeding the ego of why you think your side is right. Yep. And it's I get it. It's it's really important issues. Totally understand it. I'm not saying avoid. I'm not saying I avoid politics. I've I've avoided debating it. Mm-hmm. I I just don't. Um, I see it totally as wasted energy, effort, time. All the things that we just said are those yeah. finite resources, and it just brings. If it's a debate to me, it just brings about so much negativity. Are are is it just politics? Are there other things like I don't know nutrition, whatever, like th- things within what you would consider kind of your wheelhouse or things that you're really interested and passionate about? Do you avoid debates in general, or is it just about? politics and religion and what uh, I, I I intentionally debate those. The other ones like if it pops up, I'm out. Like yep. I'll talk I'll talk politics until two two different divergent sides appear and then mm-hmm. I'm out. Because once that happens, if that happens in nutrition, I'll feel out the room. Right. And are they do they want to um learn and share or are they just there to preach? And if it's just mm-hmm. preach, I'll just take the seat of the listener and I'll just listen to them because I might learn something. But if it's a, no, let's go back and forth. I want to learn something. Let's, let's share your side. Then I'll, I'll do the back and forth and, and debate it. Mm-hmm. That's funny. Yeah. I, I totally feel that. I grew up in a family, my, my mom's ext- like my extended family on my mom's side for, you know, every year we did it, we, we got together at some point. My grandfather would sit down at the table and he would, he would, he said this, he says, let's throw some meat on the table. And then it would become an argument between, and you know, he, he was, he's since passed recently, but he was very conservative and it would inevitably, I know he enjoyed it because what it was, it ended up being all the grandkids on one side, because generationally there's just a completely different world than him. And I, and I, 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 I could see the people in the family who did kind of what you did, like engaged for the time that it was relatively enjoyable. And then the second it became mildly a debate, they bounced and the, some of us stayed. And truthfully, like I, I those are some of my favorite memories uh-huh. uh, of my grandfather and of, of that period of life because, and, but at the same time, I know that it's, it's also like, I remember at the end of one of them saying like, well, I guess we didn't change each other's minds today. And he looked at me like, that was never the intent here. That was never going to happen. That was not the point. And so that was a good, that was a good lesson for me to remember. Like, that's a very, that's a very high bar to, 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 to. So then what over. is, what is the, help me out. What is the point then? What is, if it's, if you're vehemently discussing something that you believe in, and your goal to me is when you're doing that is to persuade the other side that your side is valid, but that's, you're saying that's not the goal. What is the goal of? Yeah. I mean, I do think that's the goal for a lot of people and that's why it's yeah. So what was your grandfather frustrating experience connect but over for, something? Passionate. Yeah. For me, it was an opportunity and I was younger. So it was an opportunity to explore ideas out loud that I had only half tried to figure out for myself. Mm. And so the, the, the fun of it was, can I make a good point to a smart person? Can I, can I get him to at least concede like, okay, I see that. I understand where you're coming from. And he disagrees. He disagreed about just about everything, but can I, can I, can I articulate an idea, a thought, a perspective, an opinion clearly enough that at least somebody who disagrees with me hears it. And that to me was the fun. Yeah. I, I, I like that because, you know, they, they always say, um, you have two ears and one mouth. And if you want to learn, you should shut, shut up and listen. I actually disagree with that. I found some of the, like my most learning is, is exactly what you're saying is when you're formulating the thoughts in real time and connecting the dots and you speaking it out loud helps so much in the formulation of those thoughts and that growth process and that learning. You know, you take something that you have a loose understanding of, you get in a conversation and you find yourself making connections in real time that you never would have otherwise. So from that perspective, I love it. Yeah. That's so funny that you say that because it's, I don't think people really appreciate that that is, that that happens as frequently as it does. 
when I'm when I talk after to- cl- yeah when I'm after class talking to the group and I have an idea of what I'm talking about yeah I'll kind of like shock myself of where the connections come about I'm like whoa yeah. didn't I didn't have that before this talk yeah it's so funny because this is a lesson I've actually learned in the last couple of years I've always and it's 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 a kind of multi layered le- lesson but it's I always thought like the way I learned, the way I kind of understood or figured out what I thought was by sitting down and writing it, right? Like that was always my identity. That was always what I enjoyed doing. And, um, and it's only been in the last couple of years that I, that I actually released from my own sort of, uh, um, uh, mental restrictions, the idea that I can't actually think out loud and figure something Mm -hmm. out, figure something out, out loud, um, the story with my grandfather, notwithstanding, like it was always like a very limiting belief that I was like, oh, I'm like, I'm, I love asking questions. I love what we do. I love the the position that I'm in doing this and with EC and other podcasts and whatnot. And it really has only been in the last couple of years that I'm like, and it's because I do all the, all the coaching that I do now. And it's it, so much of it. I get off of a coaching call or I get off if I'm on a podcast yeah. and I think I only half thought about all of those ideas until I was in a conversation, until it was out loud and I realized, oh, there's actually something there. Or I feel strongly about something that I didn't realize I felt strongly about. Yeah. Love that. Yeah. It's one of the things I've definitely kind of like, um, has popped to like a light bulb in my moment. I hear people say it all the time now. Like you only, you, I don't, I don't know if the word is only, but you learn best by listening. And that's, I, I think that that's one way to learn. Yeah. And it's, Read a book and then give it back to somebody. And I promise you, you're going to make connections and insights from the book that you didn't get while reading the book, which is amazing. When you're talking it back to somebody, you actually make even more of those connections. Yeah, totally agree. Next question. What is the scariest message that aliens contacting us from deep space would send to freak us out? <laughs> Who goes first? Who went first left? I think I went first that time. So your turn. I feel like this is the obvious one, right? It's like, we're coming and we're going to blow up planet earth tomorrow. Like, is there any, like that's, this, I can't imagine yeah, like, is it, the question was, what is the scariest was, thing that would send us yeah, to freak out? That, yeah. The scariest message yeah. contacting us from deep space that would, that they would send to freak us out. I can't think of any, what, well, what else would give me, what, what's your thoughts? <laughs> what I came up with, you're kind of right. The obvious thing is like, we're here and goodbye. But yeah. what I came up with just to freak Not even out goodbye, because you got to give a little bit, I would say we're going to, we, earth is being exploded tomorrow. Cause you have 24 I'm, hours of just freak yeah, out. That, <laughs> that was similar to what I came up with. I came up with, you're almost ready for us. That's the message. You're almost ready for us. Oh that God. would freak me oh, out I love for so that. many reasons. One, because like we're doing something, we don't know what it is, but by continuing to do it, we're, be, we're, we're, we're getting closer to being ready, but we don't know what the thing is, so we can't stop it. So it's something. And then you're almost ready for us. What does that, what does that mean? That would freak me out, I think, the most. Mm. That would give me the most ponderance for thought, for sure. Mm. Because but when, like, when will, when will we be ready? How many, how many like days, right. weeks, that's months? The most, so I'm taking this very literally. That's the most ponderant. That would make me think the most. It wouldn't make me freak out. Really? That would make me freak out. Well, the other way to like freak out, like the world would freak out is if they like talk to something. If they're like, we know something about like, like the, we have proof about some sort of like religion thing, right? Like, yep. cause this is what every war has ever been mm. fought over essentially is like, re- yeah. not every war, but you know, if we're going to talk about like how humans are going to freak out, like if they're like this dot, 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 God, dot, yep. dot, dot, yep. people are like, ah, no. <laughs> yep. Okay. Next one. Uh, what is something that every teenager should know? You're up. Okay. So I, in thinking about this question, I realized that I have so many thoughts. Um, and <laughs> the reason is, Man, I like this shit was such a tough, whatever number of years it was, 13 to 18 is probably like what I'm thinking about. So whatever, you know, five to six years. Um, and like looking back on it now, like you can't help but think of all of the things that you wish somebody told you, that you wish you figured out, that you wish you understood. Um, and so the first thing, you know, so 
can't, you know, I started to come up with this long list. And the first thing I thought about is, uh, every teenager should know. And it, the first is that every piece of advice you get from adult and an adult is them wishing they could tell their own teenage self. And I think that that's actually really important to recognize. <laughs> it's really important to recognize how, how much we look back and wish we had done things different, known things different, understood something. And so, yes, you've got to contextualize that advice and recognize that it's probably not for me. It's for you, the version of you that was, you know, 30 mm -hmm. years ago or whatever. But I do think that that's important because it, it's, it's a, it's a, so a you're saying put it through into, a filter system of like, yeah. this is their advice to themselves. Exactly. It's not the advice yeah. for me. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's the first thing I thought about. One of the things I thought about, and then the other big thing, and I tried not to let this, let that recognition kind of color what my actual piece of advice would be. And maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, but it's to understand that most of the things that you do in your teenage years ultimately won't, I don't want to say they don't matter, but they won't have as much of an effect as it feels, except potentially the people who you let into your circle in those years mm. have such an outsized effect on, on either the positive end or certainly the negative end. And so if nothing else, recognize the importance of who you are surrounding yourself with and recognizing the influence that they will have not over your day, not over the semester in high school, but in the decisions, the attitudes, the ideas, the aspirations, the ambitions that you have for the next 10 or 15 or 20 years. That is, to me, if you could get a teenager, if we could get a teenager to understand how powerful it is the four to five to six people that you spend the most time in, that you let into your subconscious, that you let into your mind if you could if you could recognize that and you can make a better decision about it or at least just be aware of it that to me has an, an immense power yeah that's super cool i think we have a lot of similarities here and the first one is that what is the one question and neither one of us had one question one or one piece of advice and neither one of us had one so i have a few yeah. things as well um i love that one that you just like both of them there's so much so the first one for me was What's really important to you right now? I don't want to diminish it, but it might, you're, you don't have the full picture of actually what's important. Mm -hmm. And it's not to say that like, you're not smart or you're wrong or anything like that. It's just, I, I understand how important it seems that that person said that about you on social media with enough hindsight, that's not going to be that important. And right now you don't have enough hindsight. So just that it's zooming out, the ability to zoom out a little bit, I think is so important. Um, the next one is if you want something, because I think there's this level of um, entitlement or whatever you want to call it, that it's like, I just like, and, and it's the immediate gratification and all the other stuff that if you want something, you need to take massive action towards it. And what seemingly this kind of leads into the last one is what influences that action is, I love you, it's the five closest people, but it's also what you're reading, what you're watching, what you're yeah. essentially, what we talk about all the time is what are you giving your attention to? So filter that environment. And it's really hard as a teenager because you think being the most popular kid in school is the most important thing. But who you're going to be in 10 to 20 years has very, very, very little, as you just said, to do with who you are right now. Mm -hmm. Like, yes, this is growth years for sure, but they don't define you. And if you're the shy kid, it doesn't mean you're going to be the shy kid. If you're the athletic kid, it doesn't mean you're going to be the athletic kid. You know this as well as I do. The captains of our teams are now like fat and overweight and like and sedentary. Whereas the opposite is true as well. The kids that didn't do anything are like, you know, the amazing, you know, they're running triathlons now and doing all the other stuff. So while it's important to try really hard right now, don't get caught up in the results of where you are. Just try to like everything else we talk about, hone the environment, hone the system, 
and don't get caught up in the little minutia because it's all going to come out in the wash in the end if you play your cards right. Spot on. Love that. Next question. We've got a, our one CrossFit focus question for the episode. Should CrossFit have let Monster Energy be a sponsor at the CrossFit Games? No. Really? No. Cool. No, Tell it's, me why. What do we promote? Mm-hmm. We like it's we promote health, right? So let's do the like we promote fitness. So what does the hundred words of fitness start with? Eat meat, vegetables, nuts and seeds, some fruit, little starch, no sugar. With they they it's a it's a it's a liquid sugar company. Mm-hmm. It's processed foods. Like it's just so not in line with our ethos and our values. I was very disappointed in that. Mm. Now, not to say I don't ever have energy drinks. That's not right. But no, but I understand. I don't, I don't want like, I don't want to promote them either because I don't, it's a vice of mine, not something I want to get other people on board with. Yeah. What do you think? I, um, I totally hear that. And I think that that was the source of whatever, you know, this is actually, this was a question from a listener. I think that the, the, I, I fully understand that perspective and why people were upset and why people asked this question. Like I, I fully understand it and I don't disagree with it. The, the counter to it, or at least what I would counter to it is thinking about what the game, thinking about it as a symbol, not thinking about it as specifically monster energy just let it be a symbol of something. And to me, what it was or what it is, it's a, it's a symbol of a couple things. It's a symbol of the new CrossFit, the new ownership where they're going to focus. It's not big sugar or it's not, um, uh, uh, did they sue Coke or did Coke sue them? I forget exactly, yeah, happened, but yeah. it's not, we, that, we, right. Yeah. We, I say we, that's kind of cool that that came out, but yes, CrossFit, um, yeah. sued, uh, Coke, because Coke, I think, is part of the NC, NSCA or one of those things. Oh, yeah. They they funded yeah. it and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So not to drag all that in. But so to me, it was a symbol or a signal, at least, of new ownership. And that in and of itself is, whether it's right or wrong, I don't know. That's just one of the things I saw as it. I saw, okay, we're going to be doing things differently now. This isn't, this isn't the the... Uh, brand of CrossFit that you and I grew up being part of, supporting, yep. loving. Obviously, we still do. But And so, one, it's a signal. And then it's also, I think, a signal to the greater, um, uh, the greater, I don't even know what to call it, the, the greater business community. That's a terribly generic way to put it. To say that CrossFit is open for business. And I don't mean that I don't mean that in like a pejorative sense, like a, they're selling out. What I mean to say is, up until now, at least to a large degree, CrossFit has always been like sponsored by CrossFit adjacent companies. And if the goal of CrossFit, the goal of Cro- the goal of CrossFit Home Office, I'm still always going to call it CrossFit HQ, but I think they're trying, um, is to is to grow and expand the games and the game and the affiliate community, there has to be an element of expansion in what we allow into the, the brand, into the house, into the whatever. And so again, to me, it's like, yeah, monster energy, maybe that wasn't an ideal choice, but to me, it's the same as Ford or it's the same as uh, Google or it's the same as anything else in the sense of, it says to it says to the to the world that we're trying to get beyond protein powder and sneakers not abandon that but we're trying to expand who we welcome here at this event because we want not 200,000 people watching this we want a million people watching it and we know that when somebody who's just kind of right on the edges of crossfit like oh what is that thing oh that's kind of fun maybe I'll watch it when they see, oh, it's monsters there, or again, Ford or Google, it lends a kind of credibility to somebody right on the edges of CrossFit to say, oh, like, I mean, if Google's sponsoring it or if monsters there, like, 
I don't know, maybe it's, maybe it's worth watching. Maybe I can, maybe I'll tune in. So again, I don't particularly care about monster energy. I don't drink it. I don't, whatever. I don't want to give them any money. I'm, I'm with you on that. But again, just looking at it as a symbol or as a signal as of where the CrossFit Games is and is going, I thought it was instructive. I love that we're on different sides of this. Um, and I agree with you that it should be the path forward that we are open for business. To me, you can do that with Ford, Ram, AT&T, yeah, Bank of America, Gillette, whatever it might be. You don't do it with things that cloud the values or the principles of which you've been built upon. That is destructive. That is how organizations, teams, and individuals erode from the inside out. What is it that we are founded upon? And then from there, we build. But you don't sacrifice the foundation because it's a shortcut to where you want to get to. If yeah. it takes an extra three years to get Walt Disney to – which, by the way, Walt Disney doesn't do this. Like they don't sacrifice – there are plenty right. of brands that have tried to be a part of Disney that they say no to. And because of that, there's a strong ethos and people know what it stands for. And that's what yeah. CrossFit was founded on in the originally. And because there's new ownership, we should not be taking the easier path because it's the shorter path. If it's more difficult to navigate and it takes us longer to get there, then let's do that. The other part about it was the deception inside of it, which is they filled up the Monster Energy drinks with water and hand them to the athletes so that they would drink them at the finish lines. That to me is yeah. deceitful. That is yeah. lying to the community. That is saying our athletes drink this drink after they're done. They let the athletes know that the ones with the black tab at the top were water, so they knew which ones to get. But if you're at home, you see an athlete finish the, come to the finish line, grab one of these things, and chug it. And to your point, if you're new to the sport, it doesn't bring validation. It brings a, this is the path to get to elite fitness. If I want to do this mm -hmm. after my workout, I should be cracking Monster Energy and downing it and then even pouring it over my head, which not a single athlete does ever, ever, ever ever in our sport. Yeah. So yeah. at best, this was a misalignment. At worst, mm -hmm. it was deceitful That's advertising. That's fascinating. I obviously had no idea uh, that that was happening. I, I, I don't know that I even noticed that they were drinking it at the end of an event. But it was so really weird. So weird. What, what's, what's interesting about it is like, well, you, you, you start like there's the... Like why, why, did, why did they say yes to it? What was the it was path a sellout. by which... It was a sellout. It was a money thing. Yeah, I don't know what, that. I, I, I don't, don't know that. But what is the other path? Like, what is? No, no, no. I'm, I'm not. Yeah, no, I'm not disagreeing with that. But what, what I'm thinking about is, or what the question is in my mind is like, well, a sellout. It's probably not. If I had to guess, it wasn't a sellout in the sense of like they're willing to give us uh, more cash than somebody else is. What I think, and and the reason I think about, or the reason this popped in my head is what you were talking about with kind of a shortcut, which is the people who like and drink Monster Energy. Well, those people could also like CrossFit. They're 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 tangential to each other. They're they're similar to each other. They kind of have edges that yeah. But you can't start that so, way. You can't start with what do they like and no, is there no, no, similarities. Yeah. You got to go. What do we stand? For? No, I, yeah, I fully agree with you. But that um, what I'm trying to get at is what was the thing that made them say yes to it? And and if I if oh, I think that you're right with that. Yeah, and yeah. which I think like I get that. I understand that. I think that you're right. I think you start with who you are and then you attract people to it. I don't think you get to skip that step. Right. And I think you don't go like, here's a lookalike market. Yep. Okay. Is there some sort of bridge between us? And let's take advantage of that. Where you need to go is like, what is our values? What is our beliefs? What is our moral compass? What is all of us, us, us drive that forward. And the brands that emulate that, that's the ones we want to partner with. Not ones that like, oh, there's one little connected loop right here. There's one little thing. Like they're kind of extreme and we're kind of extreme. Let's connect those. You have to, it's, it's a, there needs to be more bridges than that. Yeah. I don't disagree with that. I thought this question was going to be like, honestly, I thought it was going to be a one word answer. I thought it was going to be like, <laughs> that's why I said no. No, because I, I honestly think, I, well, I thought we were going to spend like 20 seconds on that question. <laughs> All right. No. Yeah. I didn't realize I was so I, passionate about it. Yeah, I love that. See, we already talked about that. Now, we have two more questions. Next one. What instantly turns a person from likable to unlikable? You're, Me first? you're up. Uh, All right. I can, yeah, you, you're up. I think I'm up. The, what I think is, and what I've experienced, very, very little to me, like, 
you know, instantly make somebody unlikable to me. Generally, it takes some time. But the one thing that when I hear it or when I see it immediately triggers the thought of like, I don't, I'm not going to like this person is when I hear them complain about their kids to other people. That to me is, is such an abdication of responsibility and such an indication of where your head's at that I just, I'm, le- I'm making 17 leaps to, to make the assumption, but it strikes me that if you're willing to, to complain about your kids, especially when they're young enough that you have quite a bit of, con- not control, quite a bit of influence on them, and you're talking to somebody else about talking negatively about your kids when they're not there, I'm not sure I'm willing to invest a whole lot of time, energy, attention, uh, and effort into, into getting to know you much better. So ours are the exact same. Mine is just complaining, but I'll take the complaining as a totality. It's the reason that when we created CrossFit New England, we only had one rule. Like you can be late. You can not work hard. You can cheat your reps. You can not write scores on the whiteboard. You can do whatever you want, but you can't complain. Mm -hmm. That's like, I can't be around people that are complaining. It's just like immediately turned off. So to me, it doesn't matter if it's about their kids, about their spouse, about the weather, about the politics, about the um, COVID, about what's happening in the, the PTO meetings. Like to me, I, I just can't be around complaining. Yeah. It's hard once you start putting yourself there and, re- and then because what it does is kind of like it puts the antenna up and you hear it. Oh, yeah. I think it's great. Maybe you, you, I, I think it's you great. You kind of let it go. I, you, no, because yeah, this no, is I, what yeah. you're talking about is – you've already said this in a couple of the other answers – is you have to be so aware of your environment, the five people you spend the most time with. So if those people are toxic, which is what complaining is, mm-hmm. it's the uh, reticular activation system. What you see – what you look for, you see more of. So if you are around negative people, you will see more negative. Well – if you see more negative, you're navigating the world with a victim or a pessimist mindset, which is the least way you can navigate the world, period. Now, if you don't complain, then at least we might be like optimists, we might be realists, we might figure out where, where we are, but you're going to have so much more fill in the blank, enjoyment, success, happiness, w- navigating the earth with that paradigm than you will constantly pointing out all the negatives. You know, we just did a podcast with... Um, Ron Friedman, the guy decoding greatness, and one of his doctors said, track every time that you have a stomach ache. And he's like, that was terrible because what he's doing is telling me to highlight every time I have a stomach ache. So I'm looking for it all the time. So I always um, feel sick or waiting to feel sick. This is what complaining is. If you're around people are always complaining, what it is, is you're always like, it's just the negative or the next bet worst thing. So I don't think it's a bad thing at all to have the antenna up. It's going like, oh, I shouldn't be looking for I, – I, I, I take it back. Um, it's not necessarily um, – it's not a matter of the looking for it. It's the awareness of it. It's the awareness of the toxicity that you can then remove from your environment. Without the awareness of it, it just kind of floats around you. and It's who you are. It's a part of your being. But once you become aware of the voices around you, oh, that's a really, really powerful step in the evolution of like what we're trying to accomplish. Yeah. Maybe a decent metaphor to that is is something we've talked about a lot before, which is the removing of junk food from the house. You don't you don't recognize you don't recognize or at least it's harder to recognize the psychic burden of knowing, even if you're not consciously thinking about it, the psychic burden of knowing that there's cookies in the pantry and constantly being like, no, I'm not going to go get I'm not going to go get I'm not going to versus the 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 clarity that comes when you remove that from the subconscious, you remove that from the environment, you remove that from the equation entirely, you don't recognize like, oh man, I, that's a lot, it's a lot easier when I don't have to think about it at all. Great analogy, right? So if you, if you remove the negative people from your life, you no longer have to go like, okay, they're negative, but I need to switch this around in my own life. They're talking about this, but I need to, and that constant struggle, this toggle between the negativity around you and you trying to navigate the life in a more yeah. productive way. If you remove those people, you're removing the junk from the house. Mm-hmm. Control, we talk about this all the time, but control your environment. Mm-hmm. People don't give enough, they don't take enough ownership. I, I probably don't and you probably don't as well. We could all do a better job of doing more to control our environment. If you don't like where you live, 
People complain about the weather. They complain about the traffic. They move. You're not a tree. Like move. You take control over it. Like, why are you complaining about this? To me, there is nothing to complain about. You either take ownership to change it or you change your mindset around it. If you can't change the situation, you change your mindset. There are some things you can't change. If you have a sick kid, you can't change that. So what you need to do is change your mindset about that. There are struggles, there are challenges in life. But complaining doesn't make any of those things better. It highlights them. We had a, we, our conversation with Lauren Johnson, which uh, depending on when this comes out, was three, two, four, seven episodes ago. Uh, the number of times I've repeated to myself what which we talked about in that, which is accept reality and then make a better choice or make a, you know, however we put that. The number of times I've repeated that to myself in the two weeks, whatever, since we had that conversation is pretty astounding. And that's, that's what it is. It's, that's what we're, that's what you're talking about. That's what we talked about a lot in that episode is the first step before you can figure out what the right choice is. Even if that choice is, I'm not going to complain about it. The first step is, can I accept the reality of what's happening and then figure out what the optimal choice is from there? Right on, man. I've thought about because in that conversation, I think you had mentioned like that's really hard sometimes with kids. And then I'd like literally like four or five times in the last couple of days, I just repeated that in moments when kids were being kids. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like you take a deep breath, you use that as kind of a mantra, and it's helpful as hell. And actually, what I kind of translated it into for myself was accept reality and make yourself proud. That yeah. and that to me is what can get mm -hmm. me through what, you know, and they're relatively challenged. They're just kids, right? It's, yeah. it's, it's, you know, my life is, is pretty, <laughs> pretty wonderful. So if not, I'm not dealing with sick kids. I'm not dealing with, you know, all the things that are, are out there in the world, but the recognition, accept reality, and then make yourself proud by making a good choice to me has been super helpful. Yeah, that's cool. The, the accept reality, make elite choices, accept reality, make yourself proud. I actually like your spin on that a lot because, um, the acceptance of reality when – I think that it was when I was reading um, Principles, um, Reed Hoffman, that he was the first one that put words to that. Like the radical um, – um, like truth above all else, radical candor, radical acceptance, like accept reality for extreme realism or whatever it was. It would be extreme realist. Yep. And that brought a real uh, level a, – a language to – uh, something I've been feeling for a long time. So that's amazing. And then you kind of following that up with be proud uh, of, because that's the way I've kind of, I've always navigated that as my litmus test. And it's not pride in like the, the detrimental ego sense. It's not like I need people applauding for me. I need the accolades, awards and recognition. It's a pride. Like I feel good about this with in hindsight. Like yeah. tomorrow, I'm going to be exactly. really proud of the way I responded to this situation. With enough separation, hindsight, and perspective, I'm going to really feel good about the way I navigated that. And if you bring that mm -hmm. hindsight in the present moment, it can bring a level of clarity that might otherwise get clouded by emotion. Yeah, love that. Last question. What has improved your quality of life so much that you wish you did it sooner? Without a doubt, 100% is this spiritual journey that Heather and I have been on for the last year. So I call it a spiritual journey. I don't know what else to call it, but um, it's it's a few practices of meditation, breath work, stillness, um, reading spiritual practices like Deepak Chopra, Eckhart Tolle, um, Michael Singer, you know, so this kind of like exploration, it started off probably with like stoicism. Uh, it started mm -hmm. off, I tell you back, it started off with like mental toughness, right? Yep. Mental toughness for athletes and then led into, you know, can I just be tougher? Can I just grind this out? That led into stoicism, which then led into this um, more deeper spiritual aspect of it. I've never been religious, so it's not spiritual in the religious sense. I shouldn't say never. I grew up Catholic and went to Sunday school and church every Sunday. But since my 20s, I haven't, I've kind of lost the religious aspect to it. But this regaining of this spiritual, of this like, there is a energy in the universe. Wow. Like, as I'm saying that, I'm like, you're so foofy. You're so like, you know, I should be wearing, you know, flowy pants and, uh, you know, uh, you know, I don't even know what else. For all uh, I know, you are wearing flowy pants. I can't see. I'm not wearing pants, Pat. No one wears, <laughs> no one wears pants on Zoom anymore. Um, but 
it's like that with the meditation and this meditation thing. I just wish I understood what meditation was mm. before because I just didn't I, – when I practiced before, I just was led – it didn't meet me where I was. The, t- the types of meditation practice I was practicing weren't meeting me where I am now. And when, even when I go back to those types, I, it doesn't work. So it was the exploration. Again, I'll say – like I've said this so many times. I got tricked into meditating because I thought I was right. doing being a badass. Yeah. I thought I was doing Wim Hof breathing and doing something really tough and cool and hard. And I just like got boom, like hacked into this super deep spiritual space along with all this other stuff. And it has been the fastest, most transformative thing I have ever done, um, including finding CrossFit because that what, that's what I would actually put next was – If I had found CrossFit, it's that same sort of awakening of, oh, this is what health is. Oh, this is what nutrition is. Oh, this is what um, performance looks like. Oh, this is what work capacity means. And putting, defining things every, so what is, you know, before CrossFit, like everyone, everything was a functional movement pattern. Well, until you define it, what it actually is, natural. It's a universal motor recruitment pattern. It's essential. It's unique in its ability to express power. Once you understand the true inner workings of the things that make CrossFit go, it's the most, in terms of health perspective, you can't argue with it. You can't. Mm-hmm. Everything else is, is like a derivative of it, but it is the strength and conditioning program because of what it stands for and the way it's defined. Well, that's a little bit of what I feel like now with a spiritual practice is like, okay, like all the religions and all the rest, like they all fit in now. I get it. Just like triathlon has a space, just like yoga has a space, just like strength and conditioning and strong man and all these, they all have their space and they all are right, but they're just little pieces of what we're trying to do. And to me, that's like this, what really kind of like religions, they're all right. It's just these different flavors of the same dessert. So I wish I had found that earlier. Was that the, I don't remember what the question was. That was the question, right? Wish you had found earlier. It's improved your quality so much that you wish you did it sooner. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That. So that. (laughs) I love that. That's, that's a great answer. Um, How much of it just cause just, I'm I'm really curious and we've, we've talked around the edges a little bit of it. How much, and I'm sure that the, I'm sure that it's a lot, but I'm just curious how you separate, how much of it, And what you've gotten out of it is because of what it is and how much of it is because it's something that you and Heather are doing together and figuring out together and exploring together. Like how much of it is, how much of it like adds more color, more light to, to the relationship. It's such a good question. And we ask each other that a lot. We really do. We're like, I imagine if we were, this is what we say is like, imagine if we were doing this alone Yeah, and that's all we can do is because I don't know the answer to that, right? Right. It, it's um, it's something that I don't know how much it affects, but the, I do know that it's magnified for sure. The fact that we go through this practice together. So just to highlight what the practice, it's my morning ritual, essentially. Yep. Wake up, shower, do all the bathroom stuff, come downstairs, um, get something to drink. But by the time I get downstairs, Heather is already downstairs. The house is just... It's dark out in the morning. So we get up at 5.30. It's dark, but the house is glowing with candles. She probably lights 20 candles. Mm. Um, She has very soft, meditative music going. It's very slow. It's very still. It's very quiet. We both on our own pace. We read. We journal. And then we get together and we go through a breathing practice, which in beginning took the form of Wim Hof breath work, and then has since more, um, morphed into more of like a pranayama um, um, breath work. And um, that leads into meditation. And then we talk about it afterwards. And what a, what a just phenomenal way to start our day. And then from there, I go and I work out. And mm-hmm. oh my gosh, by, I've, I feel like I have completely won the day by 8.30, like mm-hmm. completely. Um, and it's just having that opportunity to experience that together with the person, you know, I love the most in in life and be able to grow on this journey together is, um, lucky is the wrong word, but, um, it's, it's, it's somewhere in that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Like I'm very grateful for it because I know it's more, I know it's different. Love that. What's yours? What would you have found? Mine is 
So I've got kind of like a flippant answer and then I've got a real answer. And the flippant answer is like, you know, this, like I just had this office built in the backyard and it's something quite literally that I've been wanting. Like I, we started again. It's the man Pats shed. Right? For people that yeah. don't know. We you, started again. You, you, you built like an office. You've been an yes, office, it's an office in your backyard. It's a, le- it's a legitimate awesome. office. It's not a, it's not a converted shed. It was actually built as an office, but like we, like I've been working at home from home for 2005, 2006, when we started again faster, it's always been something that I did. And I've always, I've loved it. I've loved the opportunity to do it. I've loved that I've been able to do it, but I've also always known that like, it's really hard to not have a separated, a separate space to do that. You can't like, it's hard to get into flow when somebody else is around and not, not also trying to get into flow, right? It's all. And so just the, the ability to have the space has been, it's been three months and it's uh, transformative. It's been amazing. Mm. So that, that's kind of my flippant answer. Cause it's not as nearly as important as my real answer, which is kids having kids. I resisted kids for a long time. Mm. Um, not cause I didn't want kids, not because I was like, I'm not the kind of person who has kids, but because I just didn't, I didn't want the responsibility because I was still trying to figure out how to take care of myself. And I was scared that I couldn't possibly take care of somebody else and take care of myself at the same time. So do you feel like you, like you, you had kids at the right time though, because you were able to figure that out? Or is it like, kind of like, you're just like, you're telling yourself the wrong story. I think it I think a little bit of both. Like I, I can look back and I can say like, I'm glad that I didn't have kids at 27, 28, because maybe I wouldn't have stuck with again faster when I did. Maybe I wouldn't have, it, when I left again faster, wouldn't have gone to start my own thing, right? There would have been responsibilities and challenges and, and, um, uh, and pressures that, that maybe I got to skip over just a little bit because I, it was happy because I didn't quite have, I didn't have the kids yet. Right. So, so to a degree, like I'm, the timing was, is perfect. It's easy to say that now, but also I think it was the story. I think it was the story. Cause I think I, I would have figured it out if it was mm-hmm. five years, if it was now it has been five years now, but if it was seven years or eight years when Michelle and I first kind of started to get together or not to get, uh, to get serious. Um, so yeah, so that, that would be my answer. And I think the reason why, or the, 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 maybe the not obvious reason why, uh, it was, it's improved the quality of my life so much is because I don't think I recognized how hard it is for me to experience joy, how resistant I am to just that feeling, that emotion, that idea. And I still am to a large degree. Like I've, I, I've worked really hard to stay steady in my life because for so many years in my life, I just went down and then I dragged myself back up to, 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 you know, average. And then I fell back down. And so I got, I kind of like figure out how to protect myself from going too far down by, but also at the same time, I kind of put a governor uh, Mm -hmm. on the, on the upper ends. Right. And so kids having kids has opened up a degree of joy that I think I was always resistant to because I didn't know how to balance those two things. I didn't know how to open myself up to joy without also opening myself up to depression, quite frankly. Mm. And having kids made me obviously has made me realize that that that's, that's not a, that's not how it works. (laughs) So what is it that having kids has allowed you to, how has that allowed you to experience joy or is it seeing their joy? It's, it is seeing their joy, but it's, it's, it's sitting in joy for longer mm. than I would maybe have allowed myself to before. Yeah. And I think that's what it is. You know what? It, having kids allowed me, um, to be more of a goofball than I had mm. been in a decade. Yeah. You know, it's kind of this license to like, you can kind of be silly, you know, and I'd, I had grown fairly serious over the, the the first, you know, decade of being an entrepreneur and a coach yep. and all the rest. And, um, it br- definitely brings a, a level of levity and, um, lightness to, to life because life can be that it can be, um, you know, joyful and silly and light and all of those things. Mm-hmm. Agreed. All right, my friend, that was Hopper talk. That was fun. Thank you. As always, these are increasingly becoming some of my favorite conversations. So I appreciate that. I appreciate you. Thank you, everybody out there for listening. Thank you for your ratings and your reviews. Ben and I will be back with another episode of Chasing Excellence next week. 
You can get every episode of Chasing Excellence wherever you listen to your podcasts or on YouTube. Until next time, thank you for listening.